<coughs> so, is there a difference? Have you ever thought about it? Have you ever wondered, is there a difference between the Old Testament saints and the New Testament saints? Well, there is a difference. There's a big difference. And part of our understanding of that helps us to understand what we have. I would say that the significance of what Jesus accomplished just can't be overstated. It just, you can't overstate it. God accomplished something. Not like on the level of man accomplishing something. God did something. <clears throat> And what is the context for Old Testament, New Testament? Well, it's a spiritual battle. God versus Satan. And when you think about what happened before Jesus came, and Jesus is coming, it wasn't, you know, often we focus on, I go to the cross. And then we say, well, of course, there's a resurrection. We don't want to, you know, but you see what Jesus did, what was occurring before was as different night to then he came and accomplished what he came, day. It was darkness versus life. It was death versus life. So darkness and light, death and life. Jesus was manifested. He came to earth and it was, he was made in the likeness of sinful flesh but without sin, to condemn sin in the flesh. So it wasn't just he went to the cross. It was he was born and he had that spiritual DNA of his father. He was a son of God in man's flesh and that's why he was made in the likeness of sinful flesh. But his whole life started out and he chose to obey God. He chose not to sin. He chose not to sin. And his whole life was manifesting that there can be a man who obeys God as compared to Adam and Eve. And he lived his whole life and then he went to the cross And he died for us. And he rose from the dead. And then Pentecost occurred. And it was the whole package. Of baptism of the Holy Spirit. And power coming down. So. <clears throat> what happened in the Garden of Eden? Children. Oh I know. You know, They had some fruit. So I like ice cream. Forget the fruit. What happened was unrighteousness started in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve were spiritually neutral, but they sinned and they got, therefore, the spiritual DNA of Satan. They were sinners and they were unrighteous. And everyone who was born of woman, as they say, is like that up until when Christ came. But in Genesis, you know, in chapter 3, God declared that Satan would be defeated by a man. And it's clear later that that's the Messiah. That's his son. He was sending his son. And righteousness would be restored <coughs> to man. <coughs> now, we realize that Satan was trying to kill Jesus from the time he became manifest on earth. Herod tried to kill him. <clears throat> Jesus, the people in Jesus' synagogue, when he first read Isaiah, they tried to kill him. There's a, after uh, the woman caught in adultery in John chapter 8, 
there's the fact that he's telling the Pharisees, well, your father's the devil, i.e., you have spiritual DNA of Satan. They tried to kill him, but he got away. So Satan's just, it's a spiritual battle. God versus Satan. And Satan is trying to kill God's son. Trying to kill him. Trying, and finally, Satan enters into Judas. You see, it's all about the spiritual battle. And we, yeah, finally then, the Romans crucify him. And Satan is, I killed the son of God. So it's this spiritual battle. But God had his plan. <clears throat> and we'll take a look at the promise of the Father. The Father being God. And the, the promise of the Father is that I'm going to allow for man to attain righteousness again. Righteousness had been lost, and this is the attainment of it. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> we understand about the promise. And in Ezekiel, it says, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. And in Luke, and behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. <clears throat> Let me just go back. Since, uh, so that's Ezekiel 36, 27, and then in Luke 24, 49. And then in Acts chapter 1, verses 4 to 5, and being assembled together with them, this is Jesus, he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, ye have heard of me, for John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And in Acts 1.8, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and sh ye shall be my, should be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. That Acts one eight. <coughs> and in Acts two verse thirty three it says, therefore being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this which ye now see and hear. In Galatians 3.14 that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. And in John 14 verse 16 to 17 and I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not neither knoweth him but ye shall know him for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. So we want to take a look at the difference between New Testament saints and Old Testament saints and my abbreviations are New Testament saints, NTS. Old Testament saints, OTS. So, <clears throat> we, you know, the Old Testament is wonderful. And we can learn so much. It's all God's word. But, the situation for the Old Testament saints was that they had faith and died not having received the promise. And some of the Old Testament saints, and this is from Hebrews 11, they list, it goes through, these Old Testament saints. It's at uh, the Hall of Faith. Abel and Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, who's Israel, Joseph, Moses, Rahab, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel. These are all examples of Old Testament saints. They had faith, but they didn't receive the promise. Because it says in Hebrews 11, verses 39 to 40, and these all having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. So they weren't made perfect. 
and there's an implication we were. <clears throat> New Testament saints have faith and receive the promise. <clears throat> it's, it's helpful for us to know the spiritual reality because in these end times, Satan's a liar. And we see all over the place, people are lying. People are saying things that aren't true. And often what happens is that there is the two realms. There's a spiritual realm, and then there's the natural realm. And they're lying about the natural realm, but they're also lying about the, the spiritual realm. And we have to be clear that there isn't a lot of realities. There's one reality, spiritually and in the physical plane, it's God's. God is truth, doesn't lie, and what he says, that's the reality. So, we're in a spiritual battle. It's very important for us to understand the spiritual truth of what God says we are as New Testament saints. And also, who other people are. Because how can we minister to them spiritually if we don't understand who they are, what they are spiritually? So, we love the Old Testament saints, but they all had spiritual DNA from Satan. They were all born sinners. They didn't get the promise. But the New Testament saints have had their spiritual DNA from Satan destroyed with Romans 6.6. 6. Their old man's crucified that the body of sin might be destroyed and have been given by Jesus baptism with the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God the Father, new spiritual DNA from God their new Father, i.e. they are born again. Jesus didn't say well, the way you get saved or the way you get into heaven is you go to church every Sunday. Or you read your Bible or you pray or you say a sinner's prayer. He said you must be born again. If you're not born again and get the spirit in you of Christ, you're none of his. That's what it says in Romans chapter 8. You must be born again. So we need to have clarity on how somebody gets saved. Otherwise, they might not get saved. So all the Old Testament saints were sons and daughters of Satan. None were born again. And all the New Testament saints are sons and daughters of God. All are born again. <clears throat> Understanding the spiritual DNA of sinners, of people that aren't born again, is very helpful. This scripture, you know, you, you might have read it before and said, uh, oh, I kind of understand what what Jesus was meaning, but understanding that what is in man spiritually? It's Satan's spiritual DNA. And so in John chapter 2, verses 23 to 25, we, we understand why Jesus said what he said, or what he knew. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men. He knew spiritually. And, he, and needed not that any man should testify him, for he knew what was in man. The Old Testament saints were in Satan's kingdom. New Testament saints are in Jesus' kingdom. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, it says, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. So we're in God's kingdom. We're no longer in Satan's kingdom. We're no longer under his authority. Now, this is really precious. We understand that God spoke directly to some of the early Old Testament saints. But when Moses came along, what happened were that the chosen people, the, the Israelites, they were scaredy cats. I don't think that that term's used in the Bible, by the way, children. I don't, I'm not positive, but I don't think I've ever, if you, strong concordance, you, you might not put scaredy cats and see if, it's, well, maybe the new, <laughs> Chell's right, maybe the new translation, but they were scaredy cats. They heard God and they were go, Moses, Moses, don't have God talk to us, have him talk to you and you tell us. 
So this became the pattern that God didn't speak directly to his people. It was through the prophets, the kings, Pharisees, scribes. But, and we know this because in John chapter 1, verse 17, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And then in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, God, who at sundry times in a diver's manner spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets. And Matthew 5, 20, for I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Scribes and Pharisees, well, they knew what God wanted us to do, and they had this righteousness, as it were. But the New Testament saints, you and me, we have direct access to God the Father. We're taught by God. The Father, Jesus, the Holy Spirit. In Jeremiah 31, 34, it actually says that's what's going to happen. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. And in John chapter 6, verse 45, it is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. That's Jesus talking. Other scriptures, Hebrews chapter 1, Again, verses 1, but also 2. God, who at sundry times in a diver's manner spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken us unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. In John chapter 16, verse 13. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he now sh shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. And then 1 John chapter 2, verses 20, verse 27. But the anointing, and the anointing is the Holy Spirit. But the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you, and you need not that any man teach you, but as that the same anointing teaches you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, you shall abide in him. We really, uh, and Pastor Cox actually has touched on this a little bit as he's been going over talking about Saul and David and Jonathan and other things. There's this difference, Pastor Cox has brought out some of the, what, what New Testament teaching is on our enemies and things. But the Old Testament, kill my enemies. Send them to hell. Psalms 54, verse 5. He shall reward evil unto mine enemies. Cut them off in thy truth. Cut them off is one of the biblical ways of saying kill them. Psalm 55, verse 15. Let death seize upon them. Let them go down quick into hell. For wickedness is in their dwellings and among them. And then Psalm 59, Verses 1 to 5. Deliver me from mine enemies, O my God. Defend me from them that rise up against me. Deliver me from the workers of iniquity and save me from bloody men. For lo, they lie in wait for my soul. The mighty are gathered against me. Not for my transgression nor for my sin, O Lord. They run and prepare themselves without my fault. Awake to help me and behold. Thou therefore, O Lord, God of hosts, the God of Israel, Awake to visit all the heathen. Be not merciful to any wicked transgressors. Selah. I do want to point out that until Jesus, you know, until Pentecost and Jesus had completed everything, you know, the disciples went up to Jesus and said, They won't let us into that town. Do you want us to have fire and brimstone come down on them? And Jesus said, you don't know what spirit you are. See? So it's this 
coming from that sin nature. And also, at the Old Testament saints, you see, understanding that they were waiting for the promise, and they had faith, but their spiritual DNA was Satan's. And so, David's a great example. He's a man after God's own heart, but then he commits these sins, and you're like, but we understand why. He hadn't yet received the promise. So this is, this helps us to understand. Now, in the New Testament, it's an absolute different, and you can see it's the difference between night and day. We're to love our enemies. We're to do good to them. We're to be kind, to be merciful to them. In Luke chapter 6, verse 27, Jesus is saying, But I say unto you which hear, love your enemies, do good to them which hate you. In Luke chapter 6, verses 35 to 36, But lovely your enemies, and do good, and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great, and ye shall be the children of the highest. For he is kind unto the unthankful, and to the evil. Be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 44, But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. When we have the spiritual DNA of Satan, this stuff is, you got to be kidding. There is no way. That's what makes what Jesus did so marvelous, so fantastic, so Tremendous that we can't overstate it. <coughs> and this is, this I think is really precious, okay, among other things. See, the Old Testament saints, they're thinking in ways not God's. They're spiritual sons and daughters of Satan. In Isaiah 55, verses 8 to 9, it says, God speaking, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. See, it was impossible for sons of Satan to be thinking and behaving like God. And <clears throat> when Jesus was dealing with in chapter 8 of John, he's dealing with the Pharisees. He's dealing with those that are trying to come and they're, 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 they're questioning him and they're, they're basically uh, arguing with him. And it's where he says, well, you're trying to murder me. And the servant of sin, if you sin, you're the servant of sin. Because he's talking about being free and they say, oh, Abraham's our father. We've never been in bondage to any man. And he goes on to basically explain, you see, they are of the earth and he is from heaven. His spiritual DNA is God the Father's and theirs is not. So John chapter 8, verse 23 says, And he said unto them, You are from beneath, I am from above. Ye are of this world, I am not of this world. So the New Testament saints... <coughs> There's a big difference. Christ's mind is in us. And we're to have the mind of Christ. It makes it so much easier when, well, who's your spiritual father? Satan. Who's your spiritual father? God the Father. So I should think like him and I should act like him because he's my father. Just like if we see... One of the fathers here, we look at their child and they talk like their father and act like their father and that's because that's their father. And in Philippians it says, let this mind be in you which also, which was also in Christ Jesus. In Philippians chapter 2 verse 13, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So God's in us. 
giving you that thought. Oh, maybe they need prayer. Maybe I should go over and, and pray for them. And then you go over and pray for them. His thoughts are our thoughts. His ways of our ways, you see. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16, For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. 2 Timothy verse, chapter 1, verse 7, for, for God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. The mind we have when we're sons of Satan, daughters of Satan, it's reprobate. It's, it's terrible. And Hebrews chapter 10, verse 16. This is a covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. If you're born again, God says spiritually he's written his laws in your mind. Oh no, how could that be? He's God. <clears throat> the Old Testament saints, they were given the law. What did they do? The Old Testament saints, the ones that had faith, they tried to follow the law. They worked at being righteous. They train themselves. I should be kind. I should be generous. I'm trying to be good. It was all about works. Did you go to the temple this week? Did you make sac? Good, okay. What else? Did they were trying. Those that had faith. But the New Testament saints, we follow Jesus. We're led by the Holy Spirit. We are under a law. We're under the law of the spirit of life. And God has given us a righteousness that we could never have by works attained. For by grace are you saved through faith and then not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We have attained. God put his spirit in us but he could only put his spirit in us after he got rid of Satan's spiritual DNA on the cross. So Romans chapter 8 verses 1 to 4, this is a New Testament saint. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. <clears throat> for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. We must be led by the Spirit. Our flesh is of no value whatsoever. And if we're not led by the Spirit of God, we're basically declaring, I'm not a son of God. I'm not a daughter of God. Galatians chapter 4 verse 6, And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. See, there's a, in Ezekiel, there's other scriptures that talk about that. I'm going to take out your stony heart. Basically, I'm going to take out your hard heart and put it in a soft heart. We need to kind of meditate on these things. We need to soak it all in. Just the fact that God the Father says, I have put in your heart the spirit of my son, Jesus Christ. 
And so we say, Abba. In our heart, Jesus is. The Spirit of Jesus is in our heart. And that's why we're saying to God, Abba. There is just this spiritual, just radical transformation of being sons of Satan with hard hearts. And now, having a righteousness because of what Christ did. There's a scripture in, I think it's um, John chapter 17, and I may have said this before. Jesus is speaking, he says, I thank you, Father, that you have given me power over all flesh. And it's not about like healing and things. Power of all flesh to give eternal life. So you see, when Christ was in the cross, Spiritually, he had the spiritual power to take my spiritual life and your spiritual life and put it in him on the cross 2,000 years ago and I was crucified with Christ. That was some spiritual power that he had because that accomplished me being able to get eternal life because my old man was crucified and the body of sin was destroyed. And when I talked about spiritual DNA, I, I want you to just remember that New Testament saints can sin. It's not that they don't ever sin, or, but it's a choice. Old Testament saints were sinners. When they sinned, we shouldn't go, what were they thinking? What? No, but New Testament saints were free from sin, which means now we can choose. We can be just like Jesus. We can keep choosing. We can choose to sin, but God forbid. We keep choosing. <clears throat> and then Luke chapter 7, verse 28. For I say unto you, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, but he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. That's an amazing statement. Un until we, um, until we realize that you know, John the Baptist is the greatest prophet in the Old Testament. I know that in terms of books, we, oh, this is part of the New Testament, but in terms of the spiritual significance, Jesus said he was the greatest prophet of the Old Testament. So, but he was born a sinner. He had Satan's spiritual DNA. So he is less than anybody who's been born again. Because the born again people have the spiritual DNA of God the Father. <clears throat> As New Testament saints, we have received the promise. Kings, prophets, they were, I'm looking for the promise. I'm waiting for the promise. I want to get righteous. I want to be able to enter into, into heaven. We have received the promise. Spiritually, we have been set free from Satan, from sin, and death. Spiritually, we're sons and daughters of God with his spiritual DNA, his righteousness in us, his nature in us, we're no longer servants of sin. We're servants of righteousness. See, as a born-again believer, it's natural for me to do righteously. It's not naturally for me to do sin. And it's not how I feel. I may feel like sinning. But if I feel like sinning, I can rebuke. You know, it says, rebuke Satan and he'll flee from us. You go, I'm not in your kingdom anymore. I'm not under your authority. Get out of here. But we're not going to stand in that. We're not going to, if we don't know that, if we have that mentality of, oh, I'm just a sinner saved. Jesus' blood covers all my sins. He's forgiving and there's all that grace and stuff. We have to be a light shining into the darkness, not the darkness sort of enveloping us and making our light
dimmer and dimmer and dimmer and oh you should have Jesus why it's good just have him <clears throat> we're taught by God himself I wasn't blessed to have men in my life or pastors or things to disciple me but maybe it was good because the Holy Spirit discipled me I remember one time and when we first moved to Frederick it was only in like 1989 or so I started started reading the Bible and it absolutely transformed me and then I got to Frederick and Lorna said one time he said well how do you you know how do you get these things you know she would have some revelation or something she says oh I just ask God some question and I'll be washing my dish the dishes or something and go, I'll suddenly God will reveal to me the answer and I thought to myself I can do that so I remember I looked I was looking re into the Bible about debt and everything and some people were saying oh you can't debt is sin and I'm like well it's something off about that so I said God could you show me about debt I want to understand about debt and in Psalms or Proverbs someplace it says the righteous lendeth and I'm like wait a minute if you're being righteous lending the other person's borrowing so you would make them sin no so it's not sin to borrow there are things that you know you can go into more about the whole debt thing but it wasn't sin I mean it's a blessing to lend I got so much here you want some you know it's not so great oh can I borrow some? you know but see but part of that Old Testament you see the Old Testament is blessing and cursing basically or, or chastening and it's all if you're sons of Satan if you do good stuff You'll be blessed by God. If you do bad stuff, you're going to get it. That's the system. See, everybody's unrighteous before Christ gave us to that, the promise. That the promise came. Everybody. Job was unrighteous. Oh, you think so? And this is where we, we are in a position that is so greater than... Job said well I'm so righteous God show up and tell me where I am wrong and Jesus shows up and Job goes I had heard of you see all the Old Testament saints they had heard of God but Job said now I see you and he saw a son of God and he said I'm a son of Satan and I repent I'm, I'm trusting in your righteousness your righteousness so we it's helpful to understand especially in today's society we look out and we go what are they doing it's no surprise who's their father but that helps us people whose father is spiritually Satan they need to get saved they need to get born again they are heading to hell but if we don't discern spiritually that somebody is still a son of Satan but they're religious or they're going to church or they're but they haven't been born again Jesus said that's the only way to get in the kingdom <clears throat> so I I there's a song that's uh, uh, the Collingsworth actually sing this song of you know your ways are, are higher than mine and and I really like this song because it's like in one of the verses is I want mountains to move but you want me to climb it's a great line you know it can apply to our life you know oh God can't you just get this in? no no I want you to climb you know but having the Old Testament mentality is oh God's ways my ways you know, my thinking no we're to have the mind of Christ we renew our mind by spending time in the word we we but this is a treasure trove the Bible is a treasure trove to know who we are what God's done because are you going to be excited <clears throat> I was uh, I was thinking you know are we ready to give an answer 
to those that ask us what is the hope that lies within you? Are you ready? And I realize that there's a certain there's a certain way of being prepared. And it's it's called the color code. And it was it was developed by this uh, um, uh, man, Colonel Jeff Cooper. And it's to help people defend themselves. And I kind of flipped it and thought about evangelism. I thought about being ready to give the answer. Because in Luke, it goes into that you go into different towns and you're looking for a person of peace. You're looking for somebody who's ready. Think about this. I'm out, and where am I? I'm in a spiritual battle, and, and where am I? I'm walking through the orchard. Jesus said the harvest is ready. The harvest is ready. I need workers, so I'm a worker. I'm out walking through the, through the garden, through the, through the trees, the orchard. And there's fruit. So, oh yeah, oh, okay, this is a person of peace, yeah, into the kingdom. Right? Is that where we're at? No. Most Christians, the, the color coding is the color code white, yellow, orange, and red. And it's, in terms of defending yourself, it's sort of like the white is nothing bad could ever happen to me. I'm not even thinking. I'm not prepared. Okay? And then it goes on to the red is somebody's endangering me, and if he does this, I'm ready to take, take care of it. Run away, do, you know, it's a plan of action. So it's all preparedness. So I'm thinking, am I prepared? And what am I prepared for? If I'm in the white zone, I'm not going to meet any, any, I'm not even thinking about a person of peace. I'm not even aware that I'm in the, in the orchard, that there's a harvest ready to be reaped. I'm not looking up at any of the fruit. I'm of totally oblivious. And if there was fruit, I, would, I wouldn't know. How do you get it? That's the white. God forbid we should be there. The yellow is simply realizing that maybe today some, God's going to bring somebody into my life. Maybe it's a cashier. Maybe it's somebody at the, at the gas pump I'm standing next to. Maybe it's somebody at work. Maybe it's one of my children. The yellow is maybe today God will bring somebody into my life and they're a person of peace. They're looking to get saved. So the orange is, as it were, a target. Orange is somebody, you know, you, you run, you know, you, you've already talked to the cashier, you're right, whatever, but all of a sudden somebody's like, oh, I'm having such a tough time. And you're like, oh, okay. Maybe this person needs Jesus or encouragement away. And so orange is there's somebody you're thinking maybe. And the red would be the Holy Spirit's, of course, guiding you the whole time. The Holy Spirit, it may be that the person says something as simple as, I need to know Jesus. And that's the moment you go, okay, Lord, I'm ready. I'm ready to share Jesus. I'm ready to share the gospel. I'm ready for this person to enter into your kingdom. Believe, repent, water baptism, baptism of the Holy Spirit, power comes down. I'm ready. I understand. So are you there? Are you ready? Are you prepared? Do you know the gospel? This is why we should understand. It's so important for us. Because what happens if, okay, we die, we're saved, we get up to heaven, and God just, there are all this fruit in our life. And maybe there was just one person from now until I pass away. But I wasn't ready. I wasn't, I was in the, the white zone. I was completely oblivious. They even said, oh, I'd like to know Jesus. Oh, good, I I'll pray for you, you know, and, and you walk away. So we have the most significant thing in Christ. It is absolutely marvelous and fantastic. And this is what the scripture says. It's not that I make myself righteous, but what Christ did 
was the promise of the Father accomplished what was messed up in the Garden of Eden and gave us back that righteousness. And we're led by the Spirit of God. And that, you see, when we're walking in the Spirit, all the laws will never go and do anything sinful by following the Spirit. There's never a condemnation because you're walking in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God is leading you, guiding you, directing you. And therefore, you shouldn't feel condemned. If you're in sin, the Holy Spirit convicts you, says, that's wrong, don't do that. And you're back in the light. But you should never feel condemned. That's Satan. That's Satan, you say. I'm a daughter of God. I'm a son of God. I'm not in your kingdom anymore. I'm in his kingdom. So, the question isn't, as the new year starts, okay, well, I'm going to read through the Bible, the whole Bible, three times. If the Holy Spirit's telling you to do that, great. You'll be walking in the Spirit. If somehow your flesh is like, oh, I should be better, or I should know more, I, forget it. This is why he who the Son sets free is free indeed. We don't want to have religion without the power. People don't need Jesus to have some philosophy or try to be good. Or, they need to be set free. He sets us free. He destroys our sin nature. So we're no longer servants. We're now free to choose. And it's night and day. And if you don't have that, you need to get saved. You could go into another church and say, how many of you sinners? Everybody's going to raise their hand. You, and you say, you ought to get saved. You ought to get born again. And walk in that. But if we don't know that, if we have some simple, like, you know, we put God into some, well, his blood keeps covering all the sins that I keep making. You know, And the world looks at our life and says, well, you look like a son of Satan. Oh, no, I'm a Christian. Well, that's not... You know, all our works are going to be burned. You know, when people say the fire comes down, no, the Holy Spirit comes down in there as a flame of fire. But the Holy Spirit comes down. But fire is going to burn up our works. And if they're from the flesh, puff of smoke. If they're from the the Holy Spirit leading and dying, you know, we're led by the Holy Spirit. They'll be jewels. God did this and this and this and this. It's marvelous. It's marvelous. But that's what we have to offer people. Not some sort of different philosophy of life. And, and we learn. And the Holy Spirit may be working with you. It's like David today shared something. The Holy Spirit was working in him. Showing him something and, and helping him. He loves us. Don't blame pastors. Don't blame your parents. Well, I never really understood the Bible very well because my pastor and gets or the elders or or my parents or my friends or you know taught a God, the Holy Spirit in you. I, there's a testimony of uh, Todd White. He was a drug addict. He was like you know he was acting like he was from the pit of hell. And he went into a church one day and he went up to the pastor and he was saying, I, I should just take my life. The pastor said, well, if your life is so worthless, why don't you give it to Jesus? Just give it to Jesus. He said, fine. I give my life to Jesus. Oh, when he chose to say that, he got saved. And he was in Teen Challenge trying to get rid of the drug thing. And basically... He couldn't read. He'd read the, he, he just couldn't read the Bible. And now he travels all over the world. He's read the Bible. It's so in him. He gives these things. That's his testimony, okay? But he couldn't even read. But he was taught of God. Amazing story, okay? You don't have to have that story. I mean, you'll never have that. That's his. But God wants you locked on. You've given everything to him. 
But he wants you. And, you know, the Old Testament saints, their testimony isn't like, and these are the Old Testament saints in faith. They got big houses and lands and, and, and nice wagons with horses, I guess. They didn't have cars, you know. No. They were sawn, sawed in half. They were burned. They were persecuted. They, you know, they gave up their lands. They were, see? So our life with Christ, though, is we're spiritually in God's lap. We're children. He's our father. And life is hard down here. And people are going to hell. And the question is, are we going to be workers harvesting? Are we going to be manifesting that, okay, today's a rough day, but I'm a son of God. Jesus loves me. Jesus, I can cry, Abba, because, see, I know. Do you know that Jesus, the spirit of Jesus, is in your heart? What an amazing thing. The Holy Spirit is in me. It gets kind of crowded in here, you know, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, me, you know. Great. So it's not works. Faith without works is dead. If you're not doing anything, if you're not manifesting the works of the Holy Spirit, but the works of the enemy, Jesus said, I came to destroy the works of Satan. If your works are looking like Satan's, you need to get born again. But realize God loves you. He so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shouldn't perish but have eternal life. We have gone from night to day. We have gone from darkness to light. We've gone from death to eternal life. That's who Jesus is. That's what we have to share when somebody says, well, what's the hope that lies within you? It's marvelous. And it's all in God's word. This is what he says the spiritual reality is. And we need to believe because he said it and he doesn't lie. Let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for your spirit, Lord. We pray that this revelation, these revelations of who we are as New Testament saints sinks deep into us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to be prepared to uh, notice those persons of peace who come into our life who are ready to get born again. Help us, Lord, to manifest um, <coughs> your son, Jesus, that the light dispels the darkness. We thank you, Lord, that we're in this time. There are many that... Uh, need to get saved. And so, Lord, we, we pray, Lord, that by your Spirit you would bring many people into our lives that would uh, be your persons of peace, wanting Jesus, seeking God, ready to enter into the kingdom. And use us, Lord, in these end times. And I pray a blessing on this church. Lord, may your word just so enliven us. May this encourage us all to spend time in your word, even as Jesus said, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Oh, Jesus, you are the bread of life. And every day, every day, we need to uh, nourish our, our spirit man with your bread, your word. Lord, help us to, uh, to spend even a few minutes in your word because it is so so helpful, Lord, in these end times. Help us, Lord, to manifest our sonship, our daughtership. Thank you so much for your love. Thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. And in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen.